to kind of take off on what the topic that we're going to be discussing here today uh, has to do with uh, you know the impact of the uh, pandemic, the vaccine, uh, particularly, and sort of the overall impact on the healthcare sector of what we've all just been through and are still going through uh, with the with the pandemic, and particularly, uh, obviously, importantly, the impact of this on the the healthcare markets uh, and on investment, and and also what the the follow-on uh, of that is going to be in terms of how the different populations of the United States, how inequities have been either uh, have been exacerbated uh, during the pandemic, uh, in, and and to what extent uh, they have been, and in in which ways. Now, you know, I think underlying this are some of the fundamental things that we did uh, with regard to uh, warp speed to kind of set the to sort of set the scene here, uh, I was on the board of Operation Warp Speed within uh, the Department of Health and Human Services. And of course, we were attempting uh, successfully, as it turned out, uh, to get uh, incentivize the private sector, remove regulatory barriers uh, and otherwise incentivize them to get the vaccines out. And and that that is that has been going uh, very well. But the but the the successful vaccine rollout obviously has impacts on the rest of uh, the healthcare sector as well. And it's going to change the markets in, in healthcare. Uh, I, I'm, I'm suspecting we are just at the leading edge of seeing how that's going to happen. Uh, like for example, even before the vaccine started hitting, we had seen, at least at HHS, uh, a general return to uh, of patients uh, to hospitals. Uh, as you all may remember, there was a tremendous downturn of patients going into hospitals and other in-person uh, in-person sites of care. Part of that was due, obviously, to the uh, the lockdowns that were happening in many jurisdictions, uh, where you know people were, and then also, frankly, to patient confidence. Uh, you know, if there were a number of uh, patients. That were being treated in the hospitals, many patients would be not feel comfortable uh, with going to those sites of care uh, and getting necessary care uh, for themselves, uh, which was which was not not anything that that we wanted to see. Now there there was a general return to hospitals and in person service locations throughout the year, even without the vaccine. Um, now I, I guess a question that I wanted to to pose to uh, uh, our our panel here, uh, and 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 actually talk a little bit about their their backgrounds uh, in this because you know we have here uh, three of our uh, uh, three great panelists today, all of whom have tremendous depth and experience in uh, in the area. You know, yeah, I'm gonna I'm just gonna go through this in alphabetical order um, right now and just sort of talk a little bit about. Uh, about their experience, and they can elaborate on this. Uh, Adam Blumenthal is managing partner at Blue Wolf Capital Partners. Um, you know, he has been he's a founding partner of Blue Wolf in 2005. You can you can read about this very great depth of experience uh, in the investment in the investment world. So, Adam, you know, sort of sort of riffing off uh, that that sort of first concept. You know, what are we going to see? You know, with the vaccination. Uh, campaign really hitting sort of uh, sort of it's it's hitting records uh, every day. I think we had hit uh, in the last administration. I think a million uh, shots in arms in a 24 hour period, January 7th. But you know those go up and down. Uh, they have now you know those those have now uh, gone uh, above that. So Americans are really getting vaccinated at a high level. Uh, uh, so does the success of the vaccination campaign though? mean that the markets that we've been seeing develop over the last year, particularly things like telehealth, uh, digital health, other innovations in the healthcare area that have occurred over the last year. You know, I'll, I'll just to set the set the stage, in, in the, the beginning of March, uh, we had seen about 14,000 beneficiaries at HHS of telehealth. By the first week of April, after we had completed this kind of big bang of regulatory uh, reform, we had 650,000. Uh, beneficiaries of telehealth so we went from fourteen thousand to six hundred fifty thousand in a four-week period, and went up from there. Now, with people kind of going back into in-person sites of care, what does this mean for things like telehealth and digital health, and the success that they've been having uh, in terms of of providing 
uh, healthcare services. Is that a, in, in some ways, is the success of the vaccination campaign a, a threat uh, to these areas from a, from a uh, from a build out and investment point of view? Yeah, th- Eric, uh, you know, thanks so much for for, for setting up that question. Um, and uh, uh, our framework for addressing it, and I also I think the way the world seems to be developing, it, is that um, the opportunity in healthcare investing has to do with delivering care in a way that reduces uh, chronic long-term illnesses and reduces the cost and improves the quality of end of life care and improves population health and wellness. The differential between US GDP spending on healthcare and the rest of the world is largely due to the expense of dealing with that set of issues. Mm-hmm. And the really and, and, and so the economic opportunity in healthcare investing, at least as we're doing it at Blue Wolf, and there are other approaches, but as we do, it has to do with addressing the economic efficiency that's available by taking a triple aim approach to that area. Because of that, I would say that we simply see the increased acceptance of digital and telehealth that was brought on by the pandemic as a really great way of introducing the technology that is going to actually ultimately be able to have some impact on on those issues. An example of that would be behavioral health, right? Um, You know, obviously I think everybody is uh, concerned about the increase in behavioral health uh, issues affecting our country in the wake of the pandemic. The vaccine doesn't actually take care of behavioral health issues, right? Like you don't get a shot and if they're resolved, they're still there. Country doesn't really have a very effective way of uh, you know, getting behavioral health treatment to that population. But advances in digital and advances in telehealth do make it far more accessible. And so I think as we look at the investment opportunity, and and, and I will say that we see that in our portfolio companies that adopted behavioral, uh, you know, telehealth strategies during the pandemic, they're pivoting, you know, to the areas where having a low cost, high quality solution allows them to grow. And I I think these advances will do that on lots of fronts. Yep. You know, um, yeah, I would say I, I, that I think that's a that's a great reflection, especially going to that point of behavioral health. You know, we've we definitely there's been a, a tremendous rise in both uh, you know behavioral and, and an unfortunate rise in behavioral and mental health issues uh, in the U.S. Um, and it it was taking place already. Uh, you were, you may remember we had a a, a big a push on the opioids issue. Uh, frankly, I wish the new administration great success and kind of retracking that. Uh, in the wake of the pandemic, I think that that's going to be an area that that HHS is going to have to focus on very strongly, uh, especially in the wake of the pandemic. I will say I thought uh, early on that we'd see a diminution uh, of these things because I thought maybe the dealers uh, will be scared of COVID and stay off the streets. Uh, that is not in fact the case. As uh, I talked to SAMHSA, our substance abuse people, and they said they're very resourceful, unfortunately. Um, and driven. Yeah, yeah, it is. It's it, it's it, it's terrible, um, you know. And so I want to actually sort of pose a, that that uh, same question, Matt. Uh, can I turn to you? I'm going alphabetically. Sorry, Bill. Um, uh, I'm just going to go alphabetically um, through here. Uh, Matt is the managing director and president of private equity at New Mountain Capital, um, and again, an investor and and director and manager of a number of of healthcare companies with a really broad range. Uh, of investments. So Matt, what do you think about about that uh, particular issue? And even if you want to address uh, Adam's point about uh, behavioral health, mental health, and kind of areas that I, I don't think we had, anyone had contemplated being susceptible right. to a telehealth or digital health solution uh, prior to the prior to the pandemic. Uh, but it, right. it seems like that is in fact what we're seeing. Right. So I, I would say a couple of things. The one of the uh, consequences of the pandemic has been, you know, the we, we've all seen 
effectively a spotlight shined on the U.S. healthcare system, and and, and a lot of the areas of inefficiency, you know, in the administration of the system, have become very obvious. And there are, I think, there's um, there are there were a lot of trends and a lot of technology based uh, solutions that were beginning to get penetration before the pandemic, which have seen dramatic acceleration now. To, towards more efficient models, um, I think these the 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 pandemic has in in a lot of ways accelerated trends that were already in place, um, and that it is really kind of a structural shift uh, and a really move a big move forward. So I I, I I I'm a natural optimist. I'm I'm very hopeful that a lot of the innovations that we've seen accelerate uh, during this period w- will in fact be here to stay. Telemed- telemedicine is. Um, is one example that actually has pretty wide ranging um, uh, implications. We all sort of consider being able to see a doctor without having to go into a doctor's office. That that's sort of one that's one example. But just thinking about how a health plan can interface and direct with its own uh, membership. Um, that's now a tool that's available to you know different constituents. Um, within the overall healthcare ecosystem, and I think telemedicine will be it's a, it's a it's a new uh, complementary tool that can that can help. But you know, other elements of the solution are um, are also really important. Um, you know, specifically, behavioral health has been a, a big theme. I think we've all realized. You know, people talk about it as the next pandemic, um, and you know, I think the uh, reimbur- the traditional reimbursement structure is really still sort of not not mature enough yet to deal with it. So there's been a lot of reliance upon uh, private pay models, um, you know, uh, employer models, but, uh, but I do think there's gonna be a period of catch up now as the regulators now appreciate the, the importance of it. And, and I think it's another, um, uh, it, it's, it, it'll be a big, it'll be a big theme. And a lot of companies are trying to figure out how to incorporate uh, addressing behavioral health in the context of, 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 of their businesses. Um, the last thing I'll point is uh, point out is, um, you know, and I would say hats off to Project Warp Warp Speed. You know, the the the, the speed of uh, development of the vaccines, you know, was really un- unheard of. You know, if you had sort of t- pulled a group of pharmaceutical executives eighteen months ago and said, "Would it be possible to develop a vaccine in a year?" I mean, and it, and it's not. The answer would not have been no. We need two extra months. It's 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 a dramatic acceleration, um, and so and it's an incredible. Uh, again, I'm a natural optimist. It's an incredible um, accomplishment that I think was achieved. I one of the things I'm seeing now is, you know, anybody who's in the pharmaceutical industry or serving the pharmaceutical industry in a development capacity is saying, can we borrow the 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 tactics? And the approaches that were used to accelerate vaccine development and apply that to every other category of drug development, whether it's cancer, cancer therapy, or, or, or frankly, in any any pharmaceutical development. And um, I, I think we'll see, you know, what we're hoping to see, and frankly, some of our trying to position our some of our companies to play roles in is enabling just faster uh, speed to success. Um, you know, ultimately borrowing from some of the uh, learnings that I think were deployed, you know, through, through Project Warp Speed. So I, that, that's, um, I think that's a big investment theme that we, we will expect to see play out um, on the development side. And then I would further say, describe, you know, um, what I call the commercial access point. So the other one of the gaps we have in society is there's a great amount of innovation uh, being led, you know, by you know a lot of the drug technology companies, pharmaceutical companies, medical device companies, but there's a gap in the availability of those technologies, you know, and the people who actually should be getting them at the right time, and and that's what I think we're now seeing in the in the in, the, in you know, as the vaccine deployment is playing out. Um, I'm I'm hoping we'll see some of the same observations that a lot of pharma companies are now saying. Well, let, let's apply the principles that led to a successful project warp speed to drug development. I also, you know, hope that there'll be modernization of, you know, getting a, a drug or therapy to the right person at the right time in an efficient manner, which then acts into what Adam was describing, 
around you know, you know, making those people healthier, driving better outcomes. And at the end of the day, that, that's the biggest cost for improvement that we can, that we can have. And so you know, we have a few companies that are working on improving commercial access um, and, and just trying to you know, drive education and drive new distribution models um, you know, in a more efficient technology powered uh, way. So th those are some of the themes that we see as coming out of uh, the current period. Eric. Yeah. Well, that's very interesting, you know, kind of taking off on, you know, Adam had pointed out sort of the, the chronic care impact, you know, and a nearly in, intractable problem uh, for developed countries, frankly, going pretty strongly into developing countries as well, to be honest, right? I mean, it's rising there as an impact as well uh, with the, the, the prior existing you know, step down of infectious disease relatively. And I think, Matt, that's a very good point about, you know, how do we, how are we going to make sure this is, and I, I would say it's something, the project that I uh, led at HHS as chief regulatory officer about, like, how do we make permanent the regulatory and reimbursement changes that we made in the middle of the pandemic? There were really hundreds of them. Um, and uh, that's a whole t other topic. Uh, you know what I mean? I, I, this isn't a, this won't be a speech by me. Uh, we're meant to have a, a panel and get reflections on a different topic altogether, though. I'm happy to talk to you about that. It was a, uh, a particularly uh, it's a particularly dicey issue, particularly about the reimbursement of telehealth, uh, given the statutory construct uh, that we have in that we have in place. So, uh, but. More to come, I'm sure, both from Congress and and the new administration. You know, and I want to also sort of here introduce Bill Lee. Uh, Bill Lee is the uh, senior vice president and, and CIO, New York Presbyterian Hospital. Now, Bill, you've heard kind of what Adam and Matt have sort of been reflecting on these two sort of large categories of of, of impacts from the pandemic and and telehealth and the new technologies, or not new technologies, but really being used in new ways. Uh, and there is a development of new technologies, to be honest. There's a huge flight of new uh, new ideas and new opportunities taking place in this area. Um, you know, I, one thing I wanted to, I mean, you're, you're sitting there within, uh, in, in a hospital, uh, obviously not, you know, a, a doctor and a clinician, but you're looking at it from the, from the point of view of someone uh, sitting in the sector, in, in the, in the on the provider side you know one thing i wanted to talk with you about and you can obviously address the issue of telehealth uh, because I, I think that's that's an important issue telehealth digital health and the the reimbursement and regulatory landscape but one thing i wanted to uh, actually also pick your mind about uh, has to do with one of the pressure that the pandemic put on the provider sector uh in in during the during the pandemic uh, you know, there were lockdowns, obviously, as we discussed on non-emergent care uh, that that had a, a tremendous effect on uh, the hospitals um, and, and all in-site care facilities in 2020. So it was a serious hit financially in spite of the provider relief fund um, and other uh, things that um, the government, other actions the government took to kind of mitigate uh, the effects on providers of that very paradoxical situation uh, that we experienced where we had a, a healthcare crisis and at the same time, a, a shutdown of the healthcare system. Uh, it was taking place at the same time. Nurses were being furloughed, facilities were being closed, hours being limited um, uh, because there was, there was sort of a lot of the regular services were not uh, any longer being provided. Again, a complicated issue, some driven by government, some driven by patients' own preferences, some driven by providers uh, themselves, complicated issue. Uh, but now, now, typically, when you look, you see a, a crisis like this hit a sector, you know, I was an old m and lawyer and, and uh, finance lawyer uh, by way of background uh, before uh, getting into into healthcare entirely, you know, a crisis like this can often lead to a wave of deal making. Uh, some opportunistic, <laughs> some d driven by changes in in fundamentals uh, that have taken place in the sector. You know, I, I, you, what do you think? Sitting from where you are, uh, you know, sitting in a, a sort of a, within a, the, a provider. What do you think will take place? Do you think in terms of mergers, consolidations, uh, bankruptcies? Uh, shakeouts 
uh, in in the sector? Uh, do you think, or do you think that that will kind of will we go back to situation normal pre pandemic in terms of like uh, people looking for opportunities uh, in the space? What do you think is going to happen in terms of the pace? And and do you have any kind of reflections on where you think things are going to go on that? And obviously you can. You can address that, but you can also address some of the issues that, uh, if you want, uh, that Adam and Matt brought up as well. Yeah, thank you, Eric. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Yeah, so I think uh, you know you brought up some some key points about the impact of the uh, of the of the crisis. You know, you're you're absolutely correct. It was both um, an impact to you know the health, the financial health of of a provider based on um, shutting down uh, non-emergent procedures. And um, also, uh, you know, there was the, the, the human aspect of in terms of our, our workforce, you know, the pressure and the fears that were going on, especially in New York City. You know, I was here through the whole time. And, um, yeah, we had, um, you know, it was, it was, it was an, a huge influx of cases. Um, we're just going over uh, some of that, what happened in March, you know, and the, just the ramp up in cases was extraordinary. Um, and then we also had, you know, from my perspective, a market event, right? In March, you know, as the markets digested the 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 shutdowns that could happen or were going to or or had already happened, it was an incredible, um, you know, race to the bottom, um, ending right around the last week of March. So I think, you know, that was the that was the backdrop. Um, you know, I think you're absolutely correct that you know this crisis has uh, spurred an additional uh, speed up in 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 technology, uh, telehealth uh, that you, we talked about earlier, Matt and Adam. Um, you know, I see a lot more telehealth going on. I think it's just sped it up by years. Mm -hmm. If you ask me, yep. yeah, I think it's just um, you know and. You know, we were we are the number um, in the top four hospitals in the in the nation right now. Number one in the New York City metropolitan area, but you know we have to use that that impetus also, and we are using it to expand our footprint at a at a better cost. Um, you know, again as Matt and Adam were talking about earlier, um, but also high the highest quality care. Um, you know, and there's and there's a, there's been an, a commitment to our um, communities across all levels, um, mostly evidenced by uh, the armory facility we have, which is about halfway between uh, between Harlem and uh, the Bronx. And um, probably by the end of the day, we'll have over 75,000 uh, community members um, vaccinated um, at that facility. And so that is our main vaccination facility right now. And um, it's just been a huge effort from for, for a ton of volunteers, a ton of um, uh, New York Presbyterian hospital workers. And um, I think you know, the hat should be off to uh, Dr. Steve Korn, our CEO, and Dr. Laura Faris, our COO. They they have really um, uh, implemented a massive vaccination effort in the communities that they need it the most. So the, the 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 outlook or the landscape for the future probably includes some sort of consolidation, some sort of um, integration of, of of healthcare deliverers. I mean, I don't know for sure, but I'm just guessing. Um, and I think that those who have been able to take advantage of this movement to telehealth, um, this movement toward uh, expanding upon the electronic medical record foundation that many of us, as our delivery systems have um, invested heavily in, I think those are going to be um, what I would call the survivors and the ones who will um, be part of this, hopefully, um, um, better cost equation healthcare footprint as well as even better health care, you know, the vaccine development, it was, was extraordinary. And, and, and I, I agree that it has um, huge impacts for um, health care deliverers and but mainly for patients in terms of getting uh, better care. So yeah. I think, I think we're going to see the, that, that acceleration um, uh, and that consolidation occur. And again, it'll be, I think it'll be based upon, um, you know, the technology, but also the technology as it's used to the front door to care. So everybody should have access to care. And I think that front door, um, which is men mentioned a lot, you know, in terms of access to your healthcare provider, it has to be not just easy, but it's got to be equal. And I think that is a big 
focus for us now um, through our Center for Health Justice, you know, where we want we want that front door to care to be open to everyone. No one's coming in the side door. We wanted everybody in the front door. Yeah. And I think, you know, yeah, that's an important point. Adam, you want to address that? Yeah. You know, look, I just think it's such a great point. And, and you know, I, I, I think the really interesting thing for me, for just from our hat as a private equity investor, right, is uh, how do how do managers like us find ways to direct capital in the way that Bill was just outlining, right? Because there's clearly enormous unmet demand, right? And, uh, you know, there are, uh, there are kind of two answers to uh, how you uh, meet that demand, right? The conven- much of the conventional answer to that question in our country has been that meeting that unmet demand is either a government or a philanthropic mandate, but not an investment mandate. And I think what we know is that to build scalable resource delivery systems, right, uh, mobilizing private equity capital and, and publicly traded company capital, mobilizing that capital to solve those problems is uh, is one way of delivering results and of scaling the solutions. And I think one of the really interesting things that, you know, that we've seen, and I think everybody who's in that sort of frontline, those kinds of frontline businesses or providing is, has seen is when you're forced to innovate and get care delivery out closer to people, people will walk in the door, right? There is a way to build, you know, institutions, and we've seen it in urgent care, we've seen it in behavioral health, to you know, to uh, to bring private capital to bear. And I think if we do that, we're going to have like an opportunity to generate returns, but also an opportunity to really have systemic uh, impact. And I, I just think for all of us in healthcare investing. That's like the great opportunity for the next five years. Yeah, and you know, we we definitely saw that when we loosened the telehealth um, constraints uh, from a regulatory point of view. You know, it's traditionally limited to rural areas only. Uh, now, I come from a background in rural healthcare. That's where I grew up uh, in a hospital in uh, deep southern Illinois. So I, I got the issues of rural healthcare, uh, but but. It, it obviously we expanded it beyond that and a lot of populations uh, in cities and uh, suburban and exurban areas were really able to take advantage of telehealth in a new way and I think it really introduced it as a concept just way more broadly and that's where you saw a lot more access taking place a lot and and in a way that hadn't happened before so not just the effects of people not who previously could not get to a necessarily to a hospital or a doctor's office um, you know, for for any number of reasons, because of you know job issues, family issues, uh, having to, especially you know having to look out the family members, the ability of particularly seniors having to, a family member taking them and taking time off work to bring them uh, to a hospital or other care site. Uh, telehealth really uh, makes that issue addresses um, a, a lot of those issues that had previously I think kept people from. Um, getting access to the health care that they needed fixes it in some ways. Obviously, telehealth, uh, now I don't know how much we're going to have tele, telesurgery. Um, I'll let Bill or any clinician talk to talk about that issue. You can certainly have people trained on those things. There's some things that are going to be in person, I think, of their nature, but there's a lot more that can be done. And I think, I think we, we definitely saw that, you know, so I think, um, you know, I, I, you know, I think that there are, you know, some interesting issues here about, uh, you know, and, and Matt, I'm going to ask you, I think we're going to be going to Q&A here pretty soon, but I had one more question uh, ask uh, you all to address. I'll start with Matt. You know, we were just talking about the sort of sectors of healthcare, like what, you know, we talk about behavioral health, we talk about chronic care, talk about mental health, some of the areas. What do you think are the different impacts that the that the COVID pandemic has had on different parts of healthcare? You know, how many, what do you think has been exposed as areas that have been particularly fragile financially or areas where we really need to see a step up uh, in terms of, of either the 
the, the stability of this part of the sector or areas where kind of, as I say, the tide has gone out and we sort of learned something about the sector in terms of its, of its fragility or its long-term viability. I, I'm thinking here of areas that really got hit particularly hard or, or received a lot of focus, uh, you know, rural healthcare, nursing homes, uh, things like that. We had seen a lot of focus on a particular sector. Where do you sort of see this? We've been talking about sort of the areas where we could see positive growth, but where do, where do you see areas where we've seen kind of fragility uh, in the sector? So I would, I would say from my perspective, the, the topic of, you know, site of care is, is, is an important one. And so, I, what, what I what I think we will see is that you know again when we, we've just gone through a period where and Bill can, Bill you know in his organization would have lived this where patients were afraid to go to the hospital, they were afraid to go visit their doctor mm -hmm. uh, because of the crisis that was playing out, and there was you know I think what we're going to find out in in the rearview mirror there there's been a lot of um, I think there was a lot of um, med medical procedures and clinical care events that have been pushed out, and I don't know that that's fully played out yet. The I think that one of the one of the highlights um, that I think the pandemic has caused is really the, this whole concept of site of care. And you, you talked about telemedicine, you know, which is I think is the first step towards you know someone being in their home and getting access to a doctor. So we were able to create a patch and, and, and we're all hoping that technology based innovation um, uh, remains. But I think there's a further step, which is thinking about patient care independent of a facility-based healthcare system. And you know, the hospital is one, one type of, of site. You mentioned another one, a nursing home, which is a different stage of you know, life and care. You also have the home. Um, the home is likely to play increasingly important role as a site of care, not only in the context of a patient, you know, going on to, you know, a computer as we all are here on this uh, session, but can a, uh, can a hospital system deploy a physician to the home, you know, and can you, can, can we, can we reinvent the model and evolve it from our, for a site-based healthcare system to a, a patient-centric system where we're leveraging the sites on the basis of the appropriate uh, form of care. So I, I think that's a new framework that, um, that, 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 that will evolve over time. Yeah. And so that, that's how we think about all the different forms of care. Uh, mo moving, moving towards the episode of the patient versus the type of facility. Yeah. Oh yeah, I mean, I I I think that's a that's a good observation. I mean, we uh, one of the uh, things that I'd sponsored at the department was this thing called the Patient Empowering Technology Summit, which we called PETS, which is a terrible acronym, but you know it's the best we could come up with. Uh, PETS doesn't sound particularly good for a healthcare, uh, human healthcare uh, area, but it's the best we could come up with uh, about this notion that you you have these technologies that really allow the patient to be empowered. Uh, in to care for themselves. And a lot of that is the patients are just very relentless on wanting to get their care closer to themselves and in the home. Uh, it's also less expensive, let's be clear, uh, for that care to be provided in the home. And it provides a lot more access if you can do it there because they don't have to get a site of care. Um, and I, I'm not gonna use a phrase that might get our, our provider friends unhappy like site neutrality. But that was uh, that was some of the things that we were kind of going towards uh, in the administration. I wouldn't be surprised to see that uh, concept rear its head in the new administration as well. Once they get you know their personnel all in place and get their feet under them and, and start kind of moving on their own policies, we'll we'll have to see about that. Um, I think we're um, I think we're through our kind of panel uh, time uh, a little bit, and I think but we're going to go on to Q and A uh, from the uh, from the people out there. Uh, so I think I'm gonna uh, sort of go through that and pose to you all some of the uh, uh, questions from our audience uh, for that have, that have, again, there's some of which are pretty thematic for what we've been talking about. Um, and, you know, but I will say just on the, to riff on things you all were talking about, I, I really do, in spite of the fact that we 
received a lot of commentary on the so-called digital divide, uh, where there, you know, there are communities that weren't getting as much digital access to telehealth and telemedicine as, as they should be. Uh, nevertheless, I really think that the rise of telehealth and telemedicine is itself addressing a lot of the inequities uh, that we had seen in the provision of healthcare, to be honest, um, and, and all different kinds of things. Uh, you know, uh, so, but, but, uh, that's probably a discussion that would take its own, could merit its own, uh, panel, uh, to be honest. So one of the things that I, I see we got here as a question is, um, what, what are uh, the investment trends that we're seeing, uh, in the private equity and also the venture capital space, a little bit different as we know, uh, as it relates to healthcare and telehealth, um, and sort of how, how is the sector kind of uh, performing amid the uncertainty of COVID-19, hopefully an uncertainty that's coming to something of an end. But let's start with, uh, let's start with, uh, uh, I'll just pick out of Adam uh, to talk a little bit about uh, investment trends seen in the venture capital and private equity space. What do, what yeah. do you think in terms of that? Sure. So uh, look, I, I, I think that uh, the emphasis that is being placed on behavioral health on care management and on home-based care, uh, just building on what Matt said, is really remarkable. And you know, if uh, if you uh, want to look on the public markets at the valuation of uh, one medical, um, which uh, or the valuation of the publicly traded uh, home care companies uh, uh, like Medicis, or you want to look at the recently announced. Uh, physical therapy uh, uh, IPO, a SPAC IPO for ATI. All of those are sort of these distributed, post-acute, or uh, access-based uh, uh, healthcare delivery systems that are really being priced not based on their historic earnings potential, but mm -hmm. based on a belief of uh, what uh, they may be able to deliver uh, in the future. And I just think that for what Bill and Matt and I have all been saying, I think that that's where the investment community is headed toward, toward investing behind that belief. And it's gonna be up to all of us to deliver on it over the course of the next five years or else, you know, a lot of people are gonna feel like they were wrong. But I think there is a lot of optimism, as Matt said. That, that yeah, sure. yeah. And, I, and I think the point, I think that, that Bill made that we've, we've gone years into the future. I said that relentlessly over the course of last year, we saw years of progress in a matter of months uh, in telehealth. And I, I hope, as, I, as I've said also, that what we're doing now looks crude uh, in the future. Uh, for uh, in this in this area that uh, we get all the the good programmers and and uh, and uh, computer people uh, drawn into the sector uh, to do their to do their magic. You know, Bill, I wanted to turn to to you. Uh, there's we've got another question. I want to make sure we address as many of these as we can uh, uh, from this. You know, it, it, this sort of goes off the the telehealth need. Um, you know, telehealth. Um, and I'll say it, we were been working pretty hard on rural health broadband. I got to announce it the week before the inauguration. I was in Alaska uh, announcing a big thing we did between agriculture, HHS, and the FCC uh, to provide uh, broadband for rural health care. But um, do you see a large push for investment in broadband infrastructure generally uh, as a requirement for health you know, education, telework, but let's focus on health care uh, requirements? Um, you know, it's... Uh, do you think that there's a greater appetite uh, for this investment generally? Um, in other words, are we going to see a play for broadband uh, coming out of the need for telehealth? What do you think? Yeah, there's a number of ways to play it. I mean, we were lucky enough to get access to some deals um, a few years back um, where, for instance, uh, we invested in data centers. Um, and uh, the data centers are an interesting investment thesis because you develop a data center and it, there's a certain cost to it. But then you have a, two or three customers like Amazon, Microsoft, and Google who are willing to put in several, several times the amount that was used to build that, that center in, in terms of the equipment that goes inside that center. So I think um, you know, it, it's, it's, it's really an extraordinary area. Um, many people have caught on to it. Um, 
you know, it was one of the few times I've ever seen our investment committee, you know, take our recommendation and double it. This was several, a few years, a few years back. So um, I think that's one area. And then I also think um, that, you know, the placement of these, these centers are in, um, you know, interesting parts of the country. You know, it's a more diversified middle of the country and uh, as well as the coast. So I think, um, you know, it's also, it's also um, you know, helping a broader slice of, of, of employment you know, uh, in these, in these data centers. So I think it's, it's a great area. Um, I think that technology will improve and change and, um, it's, it's got a great, great, great outlook. Yeah. I, I agree with that. I think that, I think we're going to see, um, I mean, we're, we certainly launched it from a governmental point of view and I expect that to kind of continue, um, uh, to continue on, but, um, and you know, I, I want to, so I think that's a that's a great answer, uh, and and I, I think that addresses what that what that is. I'm gonna Matt, I got another question. I'm gonna toss this one to you. Um, you know, as sort of as managers and managers of of funds, how do you when you look at your portfolio companies and the services and products they deliver, how do you see those products, those companies addressing? These health disparities. I mean, and and again, they're they're pretty broad. A lot of them were exposed in this area, and they're not, you know, they're not limited. I think, in, in my opinion, to what would people would think of as traditional health disparities. I think there's more here uh, than uh, anyone had anticipated. I think a lot of it was thrown into pretty sharp relief uh, by um, what happened uh, in the in the pandemic. What do you what do you think in terms of like portfolio companies or even upcoming uh, upcoming uh, investments um, and services products you know expansion of product lines and so on uh, to get to these issues Adam had addressed some of this that bill bill had as well what, what do you think the um, when one of the things that we're doing is um, we're looking for areas where um, we can uh, really make a dent on the uh, inefficiencies in and around the administration um, and we tend to start um, by scanning for the market categories where uh, the costs are the greatest. Um, so when we go scan for those market opportunities, uh, they do tend to be, you know, the Medicare and Medicaid constituents. Uh, they tend to be people with advanced onset uh, diseases, you know, very advanced you know, forms of diabetes and whatnot. And so, you know, so a number of the businesses that we've invested in um, are actually uh, supporting uh, you know, the payment models in and around, uh, med, you know, the Medicare program um, and supporting the efficiencies of, uh, of payment around those programs. So um, we have a business called, by example, Cloud Med, which works for the largest providers in the country, helping them support, you know, the payments around something called DRG codes, which is a Medicare program. And the, yeah. the, the dollars are the biggest there. And it does tend to map into where the health inequality is actually the greatest. So these are people who have um you know have they not had the preventative care or lifestyles that lead them to be healthy they they usually are coming into an emergency department and are becoming a big cost burden on the system and so we're trying to we, we've been spending time in and around some of those populations um we have another business called signify health uh, that we took public about a month ago um and they're doing the same thing they're focusing on uh you know the medicare segment in particular applying you know, the bundle payment model to um, some of those same populations uh, we've mapped into and figured out how to um, uh, create a business around something called the social determinants of health, which is basically trying to build data sets on what's leading to people being sick or injured um, and then becoming a cost center and a burden for the system. And so there's there's a lot of there's a lot of business opportunities in and around trying to capture that information and map it into uh, better care, better outcomes. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. I mean, I, I think that there's a, there's obviously a lot here. The social determinants, again, there's an entire other, there's an entire other huge topic uh, that we could, we could address for sort of backing into the areas that are not traditionally healthcare, but, but have there. And Adam, I think you would, you would indicate. Yeah, you know, I, I, I just thought maybe I'd take 60 seconds as we're wrapping up to give a, a, a tiny little case study uh, of what I think is possible here. Two, two years ago at this, you know, a same event, actually, uh, I, I did a film on, a, uh, I presented a film and a little talk on an investment that we were starting out on called Modern MD. And our idea there was simple. 
we took an urgent care model uh, that is widely distributed in middle income and upper income areas. And we had the idea, what if we put similar urgent care businesses into federally designated physician shortage areas? We said, eh, Medicaid expansion, people can pay. Eh, the federal government says there's no doctors. Maybe we should put a doctor there. Uh, so that seemed like a good idea to us. Um, and we partnered with uh, the Brooklyn Hospital uh, uh, in uh, uh, central Brooklyn as a not-for-profit partner uh, to begin building these. And you have to think of something the size of a footlocker store with a great EMR system and a culturally competent physician and paraprofessionals sitting in Crown Heights, in Bushwick, in Elm Elmhurst, uh, in Corona Park. And, you know, uh, we said this ought to work, right? We ought to see 60, 70 people a day because we're the only doctor around. Um, so it took some time to educate people uh, about the idea that this was high quality uh, health care. It took some time to convince the New York payer community that this was a, a, an effective way of delivering care to areas that wouldn't and that we would have population health benefits if health care was widely available. But last year, we were the urgent care center that was decanting the emergency rooms at the Brooklyn Hospital and Elmhurst Hospital as they became overwhelmed by COVID. And every day at every center we've built today, we have over 100 people walking through the door for a COVID test, right? Because we are the only access that there is in those communities, right? And so I think the answer is if you see these things, right, they, you have to look at them and I will say that I've read over the course of a lifetime, uh, you know, thousands of pages of reports on healthcare disparities in Brooklyn, Queens, and Bronx relative to New York City. I've read thousands of policy documents. I've had hundreds of dinners with people about the existence of those disparities and how difficult it is to change them. But there's actually no substitute for going out and building something. And, and I just want to say, I think that to the extent that you know the investment community decides to do that, th there's an awful lot to do. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thanks so much. Um, you know, the, and and uh, you know, Bill, did you have something that you might might want to add to that uh, to that to that point? No, I think I'm I'm pretty. I'm, I think you know, um, Adam definitely uh, brought up a lot of points on this this. Um, you know, access of, for health justice in the community. And I think, um, you know, it's it's at our top of our priority list. And I think we actually are making uh, progress in um, in in uh, closing those those gaps, you know, in terms of pain management, general treatment, long term care. I think we're, um, we're we're getting better at get, getting better and better at it. Um, and we've been encouraged by a very generous a philanthropy philanthropic donor um, for the Center for Health Justice just recently. So, it's a, it's it's been. It, I think we're, pro we're we're making progress here. Yeah. Well, uh, with with that, uh, thank you very much, Bill. Thanks, Matt. Uh, thanks, Adam, uh, for I think a, a very uh, invigorating discussion on on this issue across the entire front. I hope that uh, that everybody uh, got a lot out of it. I know I did about uh, exactly where we see things going and trending. Uh, and maybe there is no substitute for just building something. Uh, you know, we we certainly saw that on uh, we certainly saw that on Warp Speed. Uh, and uh, and there's a lot more. I think hopefully everyone has seen with the expansion of telehealth, with the success of Warp Speed and a lot of the things that were done that there really is a way to do this. Uh, there really is a way to make things go faster in healthcare, a way to make things better. Uh, and I think we heard a lot here, uh, I think that should encourage everyone uh, with the direction that, that we're all able to go uh, in the future and address all the, the issues that I think we all agree are, are really uh, omnipresent in the healthcare sector. 